Do you think those early experiences led you to writing about seagulls? Uh, well, seagulls led me to that. That was a kid. Uh, I'd go out and the uh, uh, there was a I grew up in Southern California and there was a jetty that breakwater that went out into the sea and you could climb out of these huge boulders and kind of hide yourself down in there and then after a while the seagulls would forget you there and they would come along gliding on the on the lift that the wind would make as it went over the jetty and they they glide by and if you were hidden down there you could hear the sound of the wind over their wings and that sound there's something mm -hmm. magical about it uh, there was a time years later when uh, I had a very strange kind of mystical experience when I was starving as a writer and couldn't pay the rent and all that. And I, I heard what sounded like a voice. And it sounded like it was behind me to the right and it said, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. I had no idea what that meant. I went home and locked the door. I sat down and I said, what does this mean? Why would I hear this weird, what's a Jonathan Livingston Seagull? And nothing happened. And I was just about ready to say, this is the strangest experience of my life. I have no idea what happened. It is psychic powers gone astray. When the wall disappeared in front of my desk, and all of a sudden it was widescreen IMAX. I was in the air, and Jonathan Segal was my attempt to write this movie that I saw in front of me in my own words. It was like a dream where, where you knew Obviously, this bird was a Jonathan Livingston seagull. What's going to happen? Well, just watch, Richard. Eight years later, and this, I wasn't in California anymore, I was living in Iowa. And I woke up from a dead sleep. Damn, there's the end of the story. Not as a vision, but all of us, I just, I remembered him, and I know how that story had to end, and how it had to go on from there. So by now I had eight years of writing practice, so I wrote fast as I could write, and wham, that story was done, and it went off, and I just felt this kind of divine direction for it. And I knew, am I ever a lucky writer? This thing is just going to go crazy. And I got the fastest rejection I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. Just write back. This is not our cup of tea. She said, well, we'll give you something. So they paid $5,000 and they printed 5,000 copies. And that came out and then it, somebody, some reader saw it and they liked it and they suggested it to others and it just went crazy. From it. And you, your new book? new book is called Hypnotizing Maria. And it, uh, it, again, it's an idea I had in my mind for like five years and I couldn't find out how to write it and I would make chapter one after chapter one, and I just throw them away. I said, that's all wrong. Uh, the book opens with, oddly enough, with a flight down this same corridor. Mm. This guy is, my hero, is uh, uh, has a lot of the same experience that I've had. He's been a flight instructor. He's flown for a long time. He's flying his airplane, his little T-34 ex-military training plane. He's flying that to Florida. And he's to look along there, and he's going north of Cheyenne. And he hears a voice on the radio. He said, I think my husband's died. Help. And it's this woman whose husband has collapsed. He hasn't died, but he's collapsed. He's unconscious. And she doesn't know how to fly an airplane. He finds her. He falls into formation on her way. And he is Mr. Instructor. He is calm and cool. He says, you've got no problem. I'm right here. I'm an instructor, voice of authority speaking. And uh, we'll get you over to Cheyenne. We'll get this airplane on the ground. We'll get somebody to take care of your husband. Um, they land in Cheyenne, and he's flying alongside. And then when she touches down, he just goes on to North Platte, which is where he was going. And, uh, and that's it. I mean, instructors guide students every day. There's no big deal. But the next day at North Platte, somebody's pinned this news story up on a, on a bulletin board. And it said uh, something to the effect of uh, husband collapses, wife lands airplane. And he reads the story. And she says, it's this stranger appeared in the sky. And it was like he hypnotized me. He hypnotized me so I could land. I don't know how to fly. He hypnotized me. 
And so that's what the book hmm. goes into. It's how my hero discovers how we are on this planet. Is riding as easy as flying? Oh, don't I wish. What did somebody say about riding is, uh, riding is easy, just sit down and open a vein. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Riders, as you know, face dragons. And a lot of people connect that dragon with an empty page. How do I start? And that's where self-consciousness comes in. Page, instead of a challenge, became an opportunity. Here's where I get to say, all these things that matter so much to me, but that sound crazy to me. If someone said, dang, Richard, you have, have one choice here. For the rest of your life, you can either fly as much as you want to do. Fly. <laughs> Don't say it! Don't finish the sentence! <laughs> or write as much as oh, you want to, but God you can't do me. both. Can't do both. Where did, where did, where's your favorite? That would, boy, that, I would try to... Uh, but one or the other. Wow, yeah. one or the other. I don't think I could survive if I couldn't do... Maybe I could get along without flying. And I don't know that I can really answer your question. I think... Uh, I'd just like to leave the planet having done both to the full.